you got to explain militarily what this means, and um, then what because you write about what they can do militarily, and then this is we we need to act now. So uh, in the framing in China and Taiwan, which is discussed a great deal, uh, everyone assumes that it's a battle of missiles and aircraft carriers. That's not correct. It will be a battle of swarms of drones. Those drones will be highly intelligent, highly planned, and they'll do maneuvers that no one can anticipate. We collectively are not ready for that. Imagine a situation where China has invented new algorithms for military attacks and defense that we cannot even conceive of. Remember, I'm discussing a world where humans have a partner that is smarter than the collection of those people. As I said, this will happen in our lifetimes, and it's important that we get there first. Uh, if you take a look at Ukraine, Russia right now, you see the future of war. Um, I'm assuming, by the way, that China would start by cyber attacks and so forth. There's evidence that uh, these new systems will be able to come up with zero-day exploits that we cannot foresee. A zero-day exploit is something we've never seen before and we can't anticipate. There's lots of people who were worried that, that biological attacks can be done, and there, there's, lot, um, there's a report from the Emerging Biothreats Commission this week with the great details, and there's a classified version that all of you should take a look at. There's plenty of evidence that these things are possible. So, Mr. Wang, you see you're shaking your head. I only have about 30 seconds, but if you'd like to make a comment on what he was, that comment. Uh, I agree with Dr. Schmidt that uh, the potential implications of national security are in are incredible. Um, as, as he mentioned, I think the place we're going to see this first is in cyber. Uh, I think we're going to see agentic cyber warfare in which we will see um, incredibly powerful AI and large-scale data centers being utilized to hack into our systems. I, I just want to ask you, do you think this ought to be one of those moments of clarity that uh, focuses Congress on, on meeting these, these demands, these needs? Um, <clears throat> thank you, and I do. If I told you with certainty that in five years, China will be able to mount cyber attacks against American in infrastructure that we have no defense of, would you act now? Yes. Absolutely. If I told you that China was building an architecture for national security that was autonomous, robotic, uh, attributable, et cetera, would you act now? Yes, you would. I'm telling you those now. So if, if we don't act on uh, the mining, processing, refining of rare earth elements immediately, uh, we could find ourselves in the very position you just described. Um, that's correct. We want full control of our own supply chain. Absolutely. Energy, chips, the infrastructure that we need. It's an issue of national security for America. Mr. Wang, in order to meet the uh, demands that, that we have for power generation, how, what power generation capacity do we need to have to to uh, achieve dominance in AI and quantum computing. Do you have, do you have any idea of what that would be? Uh, well, as was mentioned uh, earlier, the, the scale of data centers that are being built require similar amounts of power as entire cities um, okay. in the United States. Well, uh, Dr. Schmidt, uh, I don't, you probably don't remember this at the dinner at the Library of Congress, you and I had a brief discussion. One of the things that I continue to point out in this committee and other places is that there's 100, 200 hydrocarbon uh, power generation facilities that have been shuttered and dismantled. Uh, we know that uh, we, we have these enormous power demands. I, I know there's a move now to go back to opening these back up on natural gas and coal, but what do you think about uh, using small modular reactors to locate them on these facilities to meet, uh, it, it's the quickest way I think to meet these, these power demands and, and the good part of this is, with all due respect to my Democratic colleagues, we're not going to do it with renewables uh, because we just don't have the time to build out everything you have to build out, including the transmission lines. Those transmission lines still exist at these shuttered power plants. We could literally, uh, we could open them with coal or natural gas, but I think we ought to be thinking about small modular reactors that can plug into to the existing uh, transmission lines. How would you respond to that? One of my personal frustrations is the regulatory structure around nuclear and SMRs. Um, SMRs are the right answer, so your, your instincts are exactly correct. Um, furthermore, they can be built in volume. How many SMRs are in use in America today? Zero. Zero. How many, where, what is the most promising one? An initiative in Canada. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because they just uh, licensed it, what, two days ago or a week ago? 
And the typical supply, the fast approval time is considered to be 12 years. Mm -hmm. That defies logic. We need a new program around much faster permitting for safer and safer fission and fusion nuclear. SMRs are the correct path. Uh, one of the issues that's, sorry for the details, is 30 years ago, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. when there's the standard for permitting in nuclear was set at a threshold below natural radiation. Alex can talk about this with great uh, detail more than I can. At the end of the day, it was set too hard. It was a mistake. It needs to be fixed. Please share uh, from your opinion how an unreliable or a non-resilient grid would impact investing, investment planning uh, and existing commercial activities. Uh, first of all, I want to just echo many of your statements. Uh, they're spot on. First of all, we need advanced AI for national security. We need our Department of Defense, our, our warfighter, to have advanced AI capabilities. Um, that is absolutely critical for this next phase, and uh, and that is dependent on energy, as as we've discussed here in the uh, uh, over the course of today. Um, one of the one of the greatest risks, if you think about the training of these large scale AI systems, it requires a continuous source of power to be able to uh, both train advanced AI systems and keep them running. Um, if we have an unreliable energy grid in any sort of uh, you know uh, competitive or conflict scenario, um, if the adversaries have the ability to take down our grid through cyber attacks or other forms of of attacks then that greatly impacts our ability to be competitive or, uh, or to be able to fight, uh, fight in that battle. So um, it is absolutely critical we have reliable uh, energy grid. It's important that we secure this energy grid. It's, it's important that we're able to protect against cyber attacks and other, uh, other forms of attacks, and we have uh, consistent power. AI algorithms promote harmful content over healthy self-worth content. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, You've often cited the example of an AI-enabled teddy bear that learns and evolves with a child, highlighting the potential risks of such intimate AI relationships. As this scenario becomes increasingly plausible, what steps are companies taking to des design systems that protect rather than exploit young users? So thank you. Um Every company is very concerned about the point you're making, and every company is trying to address this question of, let's call it a rogue AI that comes out of themselves, partly for moral reasons, but also it's just bad for business. Um, as to whether the government will ultimately regulate that area, it's not clear to me. You do have some things that you could do right now. Uh, there's a, a law called COPA, which has a 13 year, you have to be 13 to be online. I have strongly recommended to be raised to 16 for that reason. In order to alleviate strain on the electric grid, I'm curious what role or involvement you think these tech companies should have in helping to bring in new generation to secure the massive amount of power needed for their facilities. And how should these companies partner with grid operators or power providers to ensure we can properly account for tracking, growing tracking demand? So uh, when I was at Google, we made a bet on Ohio and we built the largest data center at the time in the world which was massive, and I used to go visit it, and so, oh my God. <laughs> the data centers you're describing are 10 times larger than anything I ever built way back when I was doing this only seven years ago. So it gives you a sense of the scale of the investment in what you're doing. The best thing to do is to have a strategy within your state where everybody agrees to solve the energy power problem. We found in working in Ohio that we were able to get access to the high voltage lines that we could not get access elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We built our own substations, which are also massive. That's what it takes. That's what every one of you is going to have to do to have your states be a center for AI, the AI revolution. Today, you discussed how energy is one of the factors that's changed that business model. In, in, back in those days, it was all about die size and could we stack the capacitors and make it efficient? And that was the secret sauce. And if we got that, we won. What's changed in today's business model other than the energy that you correctly spoke about to change that uh, strategy and business model in the framework that you're operating in today? Thank you, thank you, Congressman, and thank you for your time in the early days of Micron and helping put the company on, a, on, the, on the track to where it is today. Um, I think the biggest thing that's changed is the cost competitiveness of building and operating fabs uh, in the United States over, over this last 25 to 30 years has become a, a widening gap between um, 
doing that in the United States versus uh, Asian countries where we operate and where our competitors. Like construction are. costs, just to be clear, construction construction, construction costs is one of the biggest gaps. It's probably the biggest gap between the Asian um, uh, countries and where our competitors are versus uh, versus the uh, United States. Um, the uh, in fact, the energy is an area that has been a bright spot for the United States. It's an area that you know the folks of this hearing is to make sure that it continues to be an area of advantage um, for uh, for semiconductor industry, for Micron, but also for many other industries, so that we're able to be able to make sure that all of these projects can uh, come to fruition. With the recent emergence of models like DeepSeek, how would you characterize our current competitive position against China, specifically in the areas of data? And I think you've answered this partly, uh, computing algorithms and workforce development. It's an important question. And, um, you know, I always, I always, you know, AI really does boil down to, to its ingredients. And these ingredients are the ones that you referenced, computational power, uh, data, algorithms, and, and ultimately the workforce that we have to support it. Um, when it comes to computational power, uh, we are still ahead as a country, but uh, we, have to, we have to be very diligent to ensure that we stay ahead. Um, we're lucky that the leading chips in the world are NVIDIA chips, um, some of the chips from Micron and others, um, which, are, uh, which are the forefront of the industry and the envy of the world. Uh, but we need to maintain those leads and we need to, to think deeply about how we do that. Um, when it comes to algorithmic, uh, the algorithms, um, you know, I would actually say we're probably on par at this point with China. They, you know, we used to have a meaningful lead. Most of the most innovative algorithms are American innovations, but they've been very quickly replicated. And at this point, it's not clear that we have a lead. Um, when it comes to data, this is where uh, China has a, an immeasurable lead. They've, they've invested in it for years, you know, nearly a decade of investment into data sets to fuel their AI development. This started with uh, their global surveillance programs and when they, you know, instituted large-scale uh, AI for facial recognition and other technologies throughout the country um, and has continued to today. Uh, we need to, to figure out as a country how we achieve data dominance uh, and how we can do that both in the public sector as well as across the private sector. Um, and then lastly on the workforce, uh, this, is, this is an important point. We uh, as a country, uh, again, the workforce is what fuels every component of this uh, of these sets of innovation. So we need to ensure that we as a country are setting up the right programs to empower the AI workforce of tomorrow. You've written in the past about the energy consumption of AI. Um, you mentioned in, uh, in this article here on Project Syndicate that, quote, AI guzzles electricity. A single ch chat GPT query requires 10 times as much as a conventional web search. And in your opening statement today, you said something very fascinating and compelling, I think, about um, the actual scale of the energy consumption that we are confronting here when you talked about um, gigawatts and nuclear facilities. Could you repeat that uh, for me very quickly? Um, so some math here is, and thank you, Congresswoman, um, the typical data center, sorry, the typical nuclear power plant is one gigawatt. We have roughly 90 of them. We're talking about 90 gigawatts in the next three to five years needed in America to maintain this leadership. And 90 the, gigawatts for the AI da data center. For somewhere. the United States. And, and the, the, the reason I want to emphasize this is, one, this is, in, this is insane in terms of a build. Mm -hmm. Why do we need it? Because we're going from chat, the chat GPT that you know, which is language to language, right. to reasoning systems that do thousands and thousands. What they do yes. is called reinforcement learning. They go back and forth and back and forth. Right. They're not as efficient.